Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank everybody for attending. Everybody get some good barbecue? Yeah, this place is legendary for good barbecue. I'm glad to come down here and enjoy it. Uh, first time at RVA SEC. I guess it's a pretty new com conference. It's nice to have something finally in this part of the country. I think it's definitely a good thing. So my name is Colby Clark. I'm with uh, Fishnet Security, Director of Incident Management. I'm getting two mics. Um, I want to talk today about what we're seeing as the, the digital battlefield. And basically, it's uh, stories from the front lines. These are the types of things that we run into out in the field every day doing incident response. Types of battles we're fighting, the people we're, we're uh, battling against, um, what companies do right, you know, some bad stories. I could, I could probably extend this to like eight hour talk if you want to talk about war stories, but um, go through this today and uh, we'll, if we could, we'll save some questions to the end. I'll give you guys some time. So who is Fishnet Security? So, uh, I like to think of us as um, kind of the MMA of the information security world. We're kind of a no holds barred information security company. Um, we handle everything in the information security space. The company itself isn't in um, sw a swim lane, so to speak. I've worked at other companies where the company just does this or just does this. And if you need to do something else, then well, they've got to go see somebody else. At Fishnet, it's kind of cool because we handle everything in the space. Um, we carve up the information security world about 10 different ways. I'm in charge of incident management. Any type of digital investigation is what is essentially handled by my team. Um, my background, got about 13 or so years in information security. Um, worked at some of the, the big software, uh, computer forensic investigative software companies. I've had a lot of input into the design of these software solutions like NCASE, FTK, and advanced products that are based upon it. Um, worked with them in software development and out in the field doing investigations, kind of wore both hats. Uh, so what we'll cover today is uh, the war without ever firing. Everybody here probably realizes that we're at war today. We've been at war for over a decade. This is a significant war that's been going on. Really, it started about 1999, 1998 time frame. Um, and I'll we'll go into that more in a little bit, but I want to talk about who are the attackers, um, the targets, and why. What are their attack methods? What are the results? Uh, how companies are responding and, and our recommendations. So to kind of go into the, the full-scale war that we're seeing in cyberspace, you know, basically for as long as the internet has existed, it, you know, what started out as, as pranks and silly stuff turned into now what's, what's a, a highly evolved um, you know, uh, operation of crime syndicates and selling of your information, whether it's your company or it's your personal information. There's like a, basically a mall that you can buy information about respective companies. And there's advanced malware that's out there harvesting all this data, collecting it, aggregating it, indexing it, just wait for a buyer. And then you match up a, a seller and a buyer, you know, just your stuff goes on pace bin and uh, then the places, you know, who, uh, you know, places you don't want it. So I want to go over some hacks that have happened um, just in the last year, uh, 2012. I'm not going to go in depth into these, but basically every sector has been under attack. We, we see these massive waves that go across these various different sectors, like there was the, you know, the, the quarter where we had a bunch of insurance companies, and then there was a quarter that we had grocery stores, and then, you know, and it just moves on and on and on. You know, um, <coughs> retail, this is an example of retail. Of course, social media, government, card processors, insurance companies, uh, even full supply chain attacks. They don't just limit themselves just to a single company. If maybe they don't get enough information from that one company, maybe that company's too hard to get into. So they'll attack the supply chain above and below and, uh, and <coughs> contractors that associate with it and even employees at home just to get the information that they need. Um, in universities, not immune. Hotels. Now, something that they have in common, all of these, every single one of these companies, there's another, com another presentation I've given where I, I present with an attorney, and we go back and forth and, and talk about you know, what happened from the legal side. Every single one of those resulted in a very large lawsuit involving lots and lots of zeros. Um, <clears throat> so who are, the, who are the attackers? Who's perpetrating this? And, uh, and uh, how are they associated or how independent are they? Um, well, to start off with, you have nation states and, and you know, crime syndicates. But then there's also the, you know, what I call hacktivists, wannabes, and bored children. And what's, what seems 
it, they, they all seem independent, you know, when you think about it, but, but they're really not. They're all really kind of closely connected. And what we see oftentimes is that the hacktivists, knowingly or unknowingly, work for nation states or crime syndicates. It's easy to get them riled up, use them as a distraction, and they say at least 25% of DDoS attacks are actually organized by crime syndicates where they're stealing, you know, while, while the company's playing whack-a-mole with the DDoS, they're stealing information um, you know, out the back door, and you have different groups involved. The, the, the hacktivists make a great distraction for the, the real perpetrators who organized the event and you know, created the, uh, the chaos that led up to it. So how does this break out as far as the types of attackers that uh, we see, who's doing what? <clears throat> as you can see, most of it is, is cybercrime. Most of it is, or, the origin of it is, is cybercrime, but, um, but if you consider how much is actually going on behind the scenes, I'd, I'd say more than what is shown there is cybercrime. This is in as much as they can, can break it up. This is a, a really dated article, but I, I think it's funny. Um, it shows in 2009 the countries that were preparing for war, right? You know, you got the usual suspects, and then, then they got France. France is involved. France has never done particularly well in a war, so they're, they're throwing their hat in the cyber ring. You know, we'll, we'll see how they do. It's evidence that they've already surrendered, uh, but we'll, we'll go into that later. <laughs> so who are, who are the attackers? What do they look like? You know, we, we deal a ton with China. You know, of course, the Mandiant Report and the Verizon Report, and there's a bunch of reports out there. But, you know, you have, we have very sophisticated individuals involved in an elaborate business collecting your data. You know, here's an example, you know, of, of the types of things. And this is, I mean, who, who's more organized? The average IT shop or these guys? I mean, these guys got their stuff together. Um, if you take a look, at, you know, the Pentagon estimated that in 2011, the Chinese military spending equaled $180 billion, um, with really most of that being a sustained investment in cyber warfare. Tell me, what can you buy for $180 billion? Anything you want, right? Is there anything, anything not for sale for $180 billion? Um, you know, I don't, I don't think so. Um, and particularly if you have a workforce that works for an average wage of $7 per week, how far does your $180 billion go? <clears throat> My last stuff for that. So, um, probably everybody knows about the, the Red October attack. That was, it's, it's controversial as opposed to who did it. I mean, you see a lot of Cyrillic characters in the malware. You also see, um, you know, that, that the, the servers, that a lot of the servers involved in it were in China. Um, but if you, if you go back and you take a look at, you know, what actually happened, um, you can think about it. back in 2007, what happened in 2007? You had RBN, which is the Russian business network that was formerly the Russian hacking team. They somehow fell out of favor with Russia and they basically took exile in China. China said, hey, you guys are welcome here. Um, and so the, the same, it's interesting that a lot of the same servers that RBN used to use were the same servers used to perpetrate Red October. Um, and so you have the same attack methodology. It's just you basically have a Chinese-funded Russian hacker group, RBN, in China, perpetrated Red October. And it, but everybody still is like, oh, I don't know, That's, that sounds like a conspiracy. You know, but you can take a look at all the places in red. These are the places known to be affected um, by, by Red October, you know, the attack. And is there a large country in Asia, maybe, that wasn't affected, that also is known for hacking? I'll just let the picture speak for itself. But this was an invasive attack. I mean, it's interesting that every antivirus missed this for over five years. What's that say about antivirus? I'll tell you what, every, anti, every company that we do business with, that, that so we do instant response, we go out every day, every week, every company has antivirus. I can, I can tell you that almost never does it ever find anything. We can, we can sort of you know, kick it and get it going and make some custom signatures for it, and, and, and once we have some signatures, it'll go find just those. Um, there's some things you can do to beef it up a little bit, make it and turn on the heuristics, but <clears throat> I'm not sure what antivirus does anymore, to be perfectly honest. It's just a compliance checkbox. So, um, mantra, uh, so in, in the United States, we have our own cyber army, and I think this is kind of interesting. It sounds a little bit like the, the army, or sorry, the, uh, the mantra for the, uh, um, the Postal Service, and it's the U.S. Cyber Army will conduct cyberspace operations in full support 
of full spectrum operations to ensure US and allied freedom of action in cyberspace and to deny the same to our adversaries. It's a neat, it's a neat mantra. Um, and of course, you know, the US government uh, cyber army is attributed with, with Stuxnet. Um, and, and it's kind of cool what Stuxnet did. It made it so the, uh, um, the centrifuges on the Iranian nuclear facilities wouldn't spin at a constant rate so you couldn't generate plutonium in a stable way. It just basically screwed up the works, which is kind of cool. But the downside of releasing that kind of malware is that once it's out, it's out. Once that malware is in the public space, it can be used by anybody. And there are some really sophisticated derivatives that came from it that you know, were basically involved in theft of information. And uh, you know, they were, were adapted. It, you know, pretty, pretty significant stuff. <clears throat> We've even seen it in some places where, like Flame, for instance, if you, you can use it to infect uh, air-gapped networks. So this is particularly uh, bad for SCADA networks. We see this quite a bit, where um, somebody goes to apply patches to an air-gapped network, their thumb drive has been infected with the particular malware. And when the thumb drive is inserted into the air gap network, it infects the network and it goes and gathers whatever information it needs to. And the next time a thumb drive is inserted into the air gap network, that, that machine or that, that thumb drive becomes basically a vector for either passing command and control instructions back and forth or for exfiltrating data all day long. It's amazing stuff how, how well, it's, it's kind of like Skynet, right? From Terminator, it's just sort of uh, remote and autonomous intelligent. So crime syndicates. These guys, these two geniuses. They, these are the two guys, um, this, is, this is obviously um, not representative of all crime syndicates. Usually they're smarter than these guys. These are the guys who you know, perpetrated the ATM theft a while back, and, and as you can tell, they're quite happy with their, their results. Um, these guys are in jail, but that's just two sharks you know, out of the sea. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we run across this all the time, where it either goes to Russia or it goes to China. Um, and then we just have sort of different methods that we wind up having to adapt for, you know, for whatever you know, type of thing that we're looking at. Something that we've seen on the rise and that is, that I think really a concern for the future is, is ransomware. Um, you know, every place that we go into has some level of malware. We get brought in all the time where customer says, yeah, you know, we had this malware outbreak and we got it all cleaned up, we're good, but you know, the executive management, they're, they're a little bit uncertain, and they, we, we just like to have you come in and take a look and just verify we're good. And we go in, we find malware all over the place. It's, you know, ex data's being exfiltrated, crazy stuff's going on, they just, they're, they're missing it. But what happens when that malware turns into ransomware? I mean, the, the malware that we have, that, that we see out there, there's, it can download anything it wants. And we see like, these big collaborations of malware, things like, Oh, um, like W change up 32 that always brings down Zeus or zero access that brings down a bunch of other stuff. Um, what happens when it starts bringing down ransomware? Um, you know, this is really kind of amazing stuff in that, you know, it'll basically look for certain types of drives on your system, encrypt all, uh, look for certain types of data types in your system rather, encrypt all the data that matches those types, whether maybe it's Office Docs, PDFs, XLS, any kind of database, email, uh, what happens if you know, you're a company and all of your databases, email, you know, documents, all your work product gets encrypted? And then you got a, a friendly sign like this saying, you know, contact us, we'll give you the key. How much would you pay? I think this is probably the next evolution of malware that we'll see out there now that it's become very good. Yet, you know, at least the data theft. So here's what we're seeing um, with the statistics of you know, the rise of, of uh, ransomware. It's, it's definitely increasing. And in my opinion, it kind of went from, you know, the alpha testing phase to the beta testing phase. They're testing it on the home PC market. At some point, it'll make its way into big business. And um, it's uh, definitely something to think about. Um, now, the Elderwood Group. Th this is a, there's an interesting paper that was put out by Symantec um, oh, a little, uh, last year, I guess. I'm um, talking about the Elderwood group, and they've been following them for a while. And these people probably bother me more than anybody else. If there's anything that keeps me up at night, it's, it's this sort of concept, and that we, we run across these guys, and what, what we find is that the exploit methods that they use, they always seem to ha they have this endless supply of zero-day exploits, right? They just never seem to run out. And what's particularly fascinating about it is they always seem to release new zero-day exploits 
as, as their attack vector is about a month or so before a patch is released. A month or so before a patch is released. And so that happens, that happens once, hey man, they really got lucky, wow, that was cool. But that happens consistently again and again and again and again. What is that? That's a pattern, right? So how do they always have this kind of insider knowledge? And so, and so, I mean, you can, your mind can kind of wander down, um, I guess, uncomfortable past thinking about that. But, I mean, it seems to me they have some sort of presence in some of the big software houses like Microsoft, uh, Adobe, you know, companies like that, you know, that can allow this. It's it just the, the pattern of it that we see, it's, it's true. You can go either way with it, but the pattern that we see again and again where there's always an endless supply of zero days, it just, in, in, my, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, it just seems that they're, and, and they always release it about a month before the patch is released. Or they, they change their attack methods about a month before the patch is released, but it has me concerned. We can, we can take that offline, sir. We'll talk about that after the presentation. Anyways, uh, by the way, one of the last times I showed this presentation, somebody asked me if that picture was real. <laughs> like, yeah, haven't you been to the zoo? They, they do that all the time. How do you think the zebra's going to eat the leaves on the top of the tree? <clears throat> and so, of course, uh, hacktivists. Uh, the, um, you know, this is, interestingly, it's, uh, so we've traced it back to about 1989 is the earliest instances of, of hacktivism. And it's, you, don't, you don't really think about, you know, hacktivism happening in the 80s, but you can follow it back about as far as that. But if you think about it, it's just sort of a, a new manifestation of an old thing, which is, you know, civil disobedience. Um, but often sort of uh, manipulated uh, by, by higher level organizations, like I was talking about nation states and crime syndicates. Here's the, uh, the definition of hacktivism from uh, Wikipedia, and I won't read it to you. It's, it's a little bit snooty. Anything that starts off with a portmanteau is, is just a little bit too highfalutin to read, but it's... <clears throat> It, it's sort of very trendy, avant-garde, makes the whole thing seem very cool. But, but when you think about the, the, un, the unwitting collaboration um, between nation states and crime syndicates with the hacktivists, it, 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 uh, it definitely sort of takes away from the, uh, the, the splendor of it, in, in my opinion. So here's how we see the five main hacking groups. You, it really is, you have the, the top of the food chain, which is... Um, the cyber terrorists and the nation states. And then you have meat, what I call meat bots, which is other people who are basically organized underneath them that, that provide a really good distraction. And you have different levels of those people. What's it take to be a hacktivist? Well, spelling is optional. <clears throat> There's an interesting attack that happened a while back. There was, a, you know, hackers targeted the wrong website. They meant to target Kasi Mugeski, um, which was the Japanese uh, digital copyright office. But instead, they targeted Kasimagwara, which is a regional water district. And so they shut down water for some farm folks out there. It was a big win for the hacktivists uh, last year. But they created chaos, so they, they all went home happy. <clears throat> so who's a target? We hear all the time that, uh, I, well, no, we're not a target. You know, we just make lasers. I had somebody say that to me um, a couple months ago. We just make lasers. We're not a target. No one cares. Um, <clears throat> so everybody's a target. I mean, in a, in a world where you have an enterprising operation and, and the, main, the main product that they're selling is, is data, your data. They're just collecting everybody's data, whether it's for an organization, it's passwords you know, for that organization, or it's information. It's, it's a, maybe you have, they, they, they are, you're about, they, they want to invest in your company, but they want to know uh, how your oil wells are producing. We've, we've seen that before where they, uh, they just, they hacked in simply to know what the flow rate was of the wells before they did an investment. And they found out that the flow rate wasn't as the company purported, and so they didn't do the investment. So there, <clears throat> there's virtually everybody's a target. Um, and for, for multiple reasons, whether they want your credit card information, or they just want your, your personal information, or they want the data that you know about something, your passwords, or they just want your, your network to be part of their botnet. You have a thousand node network, you'd sure make a nice botnet. 
right? You've got a thousand node network with an OC3 connection. They can use you for some kind of denial of service. There's, there's almost, there's, um, there's nobody out there unless you simply don't have an internet presence that is not a target. Something else that we've seen too is, <coughs> is jump points. Ever since the Mandia and APT1 report uh, was released, it, it, changed, it changed the way the attack methods work. N now you can't always expect to, to find, well, if it's going back to Russia or China or somewhere out of the country, it's bad. Because oftentimes, they'll use networks inside of the country or grandma's XP box that's been patched you know, uh, you know, as a jump point uh, for command and control, because that way it doesn't look as suspicious when you're looking at firewall logs. Really common. Which leads into, uh, you know, smaller, smaller people, home people, smaller companies, people lower down in the supply chain. They, uh, they are much easier targets. Big companies with deep pockets, like I showed in the, in the first set of slides, they are, not, uh, they are not able to adequately defend themselves. How much more able is a small company going to be able to defend themselves? I mean, who's going to spend $180 billion defending? Nobody, and especially not a small company. So here's what we call the, uh, the hacker ecosystem, you know, and it's, you know, they, they find a way in, they'll research information. We see a lot of, a lot of stuff where they, you know, spear phishing type of attacks or, um, or whaling type of attacks where it's like, you know, they'll, they'll research you on LinkedIn. I mean, who here is not on LinkedIn, right? Probably almost everybody has their profile on LinkedIn. Um, and it, uh, you can do a search for like database admin at IBM or, and I'm, I'm just using them as an example, and you'll find, you'll find a lot of information on, on LinkedIn about you know, database, information, database admins for IBM. You can start giving them um, you know, targeted types of things, maybe research what that person's into. Maybe they're in a jogging club, they like biking, whatever, frisbee. Um, and so you start sending them type, you know, targeted type stuff to, get, you know, to try to get them interested. You get malware in their machine, next thing you know, it's, you, know you, you got you know, a sense of password and you're into the environment, which is really what you wanted, you harvested their data, sucked it out, um, and then you have it available on, on the, the open market. Who wants IBM's information? Just an example. <clears throat> so DDoS. We get a lot of people pinging us about DDoS and wanting to know, well, should we just block, block Russia? Should we just block China? How about you know, things like that? Well, it can come from any different direction. It's, it really is sort of unrestricted. This is an example of just, um, <clears throat> of just one quarter last year of the DDoS sources. And, and this map changes. It's, it's, you can go look at this, this same source and it's different every single time. And as far as the methods for blocking DDoS, if you think about it, I mean, there's a lot of thing about um, you know, blocking sin floods. And that's just really a, a small part of the larger problem. There are, there are many, many methods of DDoS. And so when, when looking into an overall DDoS solution, there's, there's a lot of uh, things that need to come, in, come into play in the thought process in order to, to adequately be able to address something like that, considering the variety of what we see out there. And once again, this, is, this was just one quarter of last year, and the map's always different. Here's an example of uh, the attack message, so what they call the Torah, Torah, Torah message uh, for the PayPal hack a couple years ago. This is what the meat bots, what you put out to, uh, to rally the meat bots. An example of some of the tools that are used. <clears throat> so the, the top one is a tool called Slow Loris, which is a tool used for attacking Apache web servers. Um, what it does is it uses up connections, one after the other after the other, and basically brings the Apache server to its knees um, and does it in a very, very slow way. It's not like a volume type of attack aside from the number of of uh, threads it's, it's using. Then on the bottom, you have sort of the traditional DDoS type of tool, um, the Voight Cannon, which is you know, very simple to use. You just put in the URL or the IP address and click, I'm a charge in my laser, and boom, out it goes. <clears throat> One of the funny things about, about this story is there was going to be an attack against a particular company using Slow Loris. And so one of the security professionals um, got on, and they provided the latest version updated of Slow Loris which was Slow Loris with a Zeus bot in it. Um, and you, know, all, you had all, the, all the, the anonymous guys downloading that tool and then joining um, you know, one of the security professionals' botnets that he had, he had set up to you know, retake you know, back control of, of the DDoS. It was a pretty ingenious type of a way of uh, hacking the hackers. <clears throat> so this is an article that uh, the FBI uh, warned banks out there now, be careful when you're experiencing a DDoS. Don't focus on the DDoS. That's just a game of whack-a-mole. 
pick in your pocket because it's happened many times over now where Zeus is installed or some other tool is installed at the same time as a DDoS. Um, and so we, we get a lot of folks who come to us you know, with help for DDoS mitigation, but that's, that's one of the first things that we say is we'll, we'll try to focus, you know, we'll, we'll, we can assist with DDoS mitigation, but that's, that's really not the big problem. That's not the reason they're being DDoS in the first place. And so when you come across this situation, be especially wary of what else is going on. Look at the either, you know, look at the lines that, or the, the servers that are not being, you know, DDoS at the moment or you know, the amount of, of information is, is, is being or slipped into the, the DDoS itself. Which sort of brings me to multi-vector attacks, <clears throat> which is really what we're seeing now almost in every case. Even the simplest types of intrusions that we're seeing out there, credit card theft with grocery stores, things of that nature, they start, they start with multi-vector attacks. And there's situations where we see maybe a couple months ahead of time <clears throat> of an attack, we'll see a big malware outbreak within an organization. And they'll be struggling to keep up with this malware outbreak and it's something, maybe an example was WChangeUp32 came in and it, uh, and it hid all the files on the file server, and so people, you know, they, they freaked out about that. Meanwhile, Zeus got pulled down and started exfiltrating information, passwords, collecting any kind of thing it could find, and sending this data out. And they spent about a month trying to figure out, you know, or get, every, get all the files back and get everything cleaned up, and then everything seemed fine. Then, not long after that, they suffered a severe credit card breach, where um, using passwords that were collected during the original malware infection, <coughs> The, uh, that we're able to steal credit card information um, from you know, cash registers and point of sale devices, upload malware, things of that nature. And so you see this very strategic you know, type of attacks that's planned out over a long period of time um, and executed in, in a very professional manner. And we see it, like I said earlier, across waves of organizations. You know, you'll, you'll find the same point of sale software in, at, at many different uh, types of retail stores. And you'll see it just hit them, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Why not? They developed it for one, they can use it for many. You know, they're, they're software developers and they, uh, they put it to good use, profit-wise. <clears throat> so what's it take to defend this kind of stuff? And what kind of attacks you know, are, are out there? There's, there's a ton. I mean, if you take a look at this, there's, each one of these can require you know, in-depth people to be able to understand how to, how to prevent and how to, how to mitigate, how to remediate, how do you respond. Um, there's a, I, have a, I have a large team and I'll, I'll hire people to, to basically who are you know, specialists in certain you know, types of areas um, and then they'll kind of overlap with others. But it's, and I have a nationwide reach. I mean, I'm, I'm hiring you know, right now and it's hard for me to hire people who are seasoned and qualified to be able to handle all these things. How much more difficult is it for, for companies who have to hire someone in you know, Richmond, Virginia or, or you know, any, any one place? So polymorphic malware. Um, it used to be that there was, you know, the, they had the common decency to, to sell the advanced crimeware suites like Zeus and Black Hole for about seven, eight hundred bucks. You could, you could buy it, seven, eight hundred bucks. Now you can actually download it for free. The source code for Zeus and Black Hole, at least the, the, the early versions, is, is available for free, which, which really um, provided a large uptick in the amount of attacks that we've seen in the high-grade malware out there. Now, of course, there's, there's a um, Black Hole version 2, which is out, which is now 800 bucks, but you can still get the original version for free. Share it with your friends, share it with grandma, you know, works every time. But uh, <clears throat> very advanced stuff. It's kind of um, amazing when you start digging into the interfaces and, and what they do, because you'll get, uh, you know, point and click evasion, polymorphism, and, and really probably the worst thing that, that made, that stepped up the game maybe over the last six months is what we're finding is malware is polymorphic per machine. It used to be polymorphic malware was polymorphic per environment, right? So for instance, you know, company A had, had basically had, had different malware than company B, but within the organization, it usually had the same hash and was, was easy to find with the same signature. That's not the case anymore. It'll have, it'll have a different name, a different hash, and, you know, the mutex is different, the size is different. It'll have something between like a 1.5 and 4 kilobyte variance in size because of some random mutex that just it just gets fired into it. Um, and so on the incident response side, we've had to really step up our game and, and develop entirely new methodologies in order to combat that. Because the, the old school forensic concepts of, well, we have a hash of the malware, we're gonna go find this elsewhere. Now, that, that hash will find that malware on one box. And that's it. 
And so there's some, some companies that we've been working with to sort of, um, to basically advance the technology into a way to, to, uh, to be able to detect or to, to, to investigate and detect um, those types of things. One of them is, is FireAmp. We work with those guys and they're, they're very helpful for us. <clears throat> Here's an example of the DIY um, interface, types of things that it has. It has like enable spreaders, enable anti-detection, uh, you know, it's uh, persistence. It, it just has, it has it's a ton of different features um, in it. Um, and then a whole bunch of evasion or counterattack. So let's say you're investigating it. You're investigating you know, packet captures using Wireshark. It has, it has a plugin that if it's opened in Wireshark, that it, if the packet is investigated in Wireshark, there's a possibility that it could infect the investigator machine. Even sandboxy is in there. If you're running sandboxy, it has sandboxy circumvention, so it can get out. So you can basically just click, 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 enable each one of these things. Um, and you have point and click advanced malware. There's even a help button, right? You can, you can click for, you can get support, right? Which is convenient. You pay 800 bucks for something, you expect support, right? And so they, they have that as an option. They're, they're here for you, literally. <clears throat> so APT, you see that standing on a laptop, you know you're in trouble. Uh, I actually found one of those in Salt Lake Airport. I'm gonna get it on my way back through. Um, but uh, we, we're finding a lot of APT with organizations, and not everything is APT, but, but when you find it, it's, it's, it's usually distinct per organization. And interestingly, you'll find like the organization name embedded in text oftentimes in it, so you know it's customized for that organization. It's kind of fascinating, some of the stuff they do, and it's, it's not always that way, but we, we, see, we see a ton of that. There, um, it's, uh, it's very, very pervasive. Um, usually it goes after you know, government sector type stuff, engineering type plans, um, and, and oftentimes they'll have molds within those organizations. We've even found places, a couple of instances, where there's employees who are working there who, who are maybe employees of the company, but they're also employees of somebody else. So what type of attack vectors? So as you know, the, the, what type of attack vectors will they take to get into your organization? And, and the answer is any, anyone they need to. You know, they, they will be as advanced in their game as they need to to get into your organization. I mean, there's situations where like they hack the Chinese restaurant down the street from the secure, secure company um, and hack the website, so anyone who goes to order, you know, Chinese chow mein, you know, from the website, you know, gets infected by a water hole attack. They'll even send out a coupon or something for, hey, five dollar chow mein today, um, you know, to, to direct you to that website. And so they're helpful in that regard. So what does the malware look like <clears throat> from a development perspective? So what's what's really fascinating is is this is this is basically a, a flowchart of, of how. Uh, a process flow of how the, how the malware um, calls all the different modules within the code. And it basically looks like any other type of software development map that you see of any professional organization, except for the modules that they're using, they're vulnerabilities. These are CVEs out there. So if they don't get in through this one, they use that one. If that one doesn't work, they'll use one of these other ones. They, they got something for everybody. And so if you think about it, um, all these different things that people have installed on their machines, plugins in their browser, and all these little add-ons, um, each one of those things is an attack vector where one of those CVEs uh, is a possibility of getting in. <clears throat> so five minute uncurred events. Um, so what are we seeing today? Uh, I've gone into a lot of this already. Um, right now, um, we have had a string of what, we're, what we call Friday IR calls. You can count on about every Friday at about between 4.30 p.m., we would get a call from some company that noticed that they got hacked, there's malware in their organization. They basically were just walking out the door and they, they caught this, this malware. And, um, and this is happening, like for instance, spear phishing attacks, uh, if you look at the trend on spear phishing attack, it's, it's Friday afternoon is the big peak of it. And the reason is they want to get an early start on the weekend. They know that on the weekend you guys aren't watching your machines, right? You're not really paying that much attention. They, they can count on people you know, not observing what they're doing over the weekend. So they get an early start, usually late Friday, and then they have, they have the run of the IT organization uh, for, for the entire weekend. Um, but every once in a while, they, it gets caught, usually by accident. Somebody saw like a mouse move or something weird happened. It, even one time, antivirus found it. Um, 
<clears throat> but uh, you know that, that's rare. In any case, those are the types of things that we're seeing a lot of. But we're also seeing a, a big uptick in companies finally realizing that, hey, you know, we really need to do something about this ahead of time. It's not a matter of if we get hacked. It's a matter of when we get hacked. And so you know, in, our, in our pipeline, if you look at the sales pipeline of what, what's been coming through, I have probably about a dozen proactive type stuff where they want policies, procedures, playbooks. When I say playbooks, I mean methodology type, uh, like, almost like a Boy Scout manual for if I get spear phishing attack, I do this. If I get a DDoS, I do that. If there's you know, some sort of a SQL injection, here's, here's how, how I would do incident response. And basically, it's a playbook for maybe uh, 10 or 12 different scenarios uh, that, that folks are, are interested in. So covered most of this. So how, what's the state of the enterprise and, uh, and how companies are responding? You know, it's, uh, right now it's not a fair fight. You have $180 billion versus something smaller. Um, probably the single biggest problems that we're still seeing are the same problems that, that we've been seeing for the last decade, which is third party patch management. Everybody's got a WSUS server and patch in Windows, that's, that's not the problem. Our Windows automatic updates are on, so what? Um, it's all of the, the third party applications that, that just never get patched. And nobody patches Java like every three hours or whatever you have to patch Java these days. Um, and so, you know, Flash, Java, Silverlight, uh, QuickTime, you know, all these little things. There's not any controls over these types of things. Um, and so they're a constant source of, of folks being able to get in and attack. Uh, the, uh, the other side of the coin, is that security um, never is able to keep up with the advancements in IT. So we see a lot of advancements in, in, in web development, HTML5 and Ajax and Silverlight, but, but never are security scanners or the ability to lock it down a, able to keep up with that. And so, so very frequently, um, da, 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 we, see, we see problems like this. So this, this is an instance where we had two best of breed security scanners out there, and I'm not gonna name any names, and then we had manual testers from, from our AppSec team. And we coded up a box that had uh, 17 different vulnerabilities that, that we put into it. And if you take a look at the performance of the scanners found, kind of found four out of 17 of the extant vulnerabilities that were in it. But the people who were using the scanners, you know, they generally have a sense of a false sense of security that hey I use the scanner and it, and it kicks ass you know I, I'm able to you know I, I, it, my server came back clean I'm good to go I can I can publish this code not, not so much um, the the security testing team we had they, they didn't find all 17 they got 16 out of 17 which is you know pretty good but the thing is is, is the highlight from this is that uh, you know it ain't what we have now isn't isn't uh, you know providing a full sense of security. Now this screen is a screenshot from Black Hole, and it shows um, machines that are owned by this particular instance of Black Hole. This screenshot shows how they got in, and then I did a, basically a blow up of it. So you see that Java is responsible for about 90 something percent of the attacks that were successful and how they were able to own it. And I mean, who, who out there, anybody have any, like, have to have old school Java for, to support legacy applications? Right, everybody? I mean. Common problem, everybody has that problem. And if Java's not updated to the latest, and even if it is, it, uh, it's, it's a, huge, a huge problem. I think they should reclassify Java as a backdoor, and antivirus should delete it. That's, that's something we can do with antivirus. So, <clears throat> so state of the enterprise. Um, something that we see a lot is, is uh, security through compliance. Security drive, compliance drives most of the security initiatives that we see out there in the market. You know, you have to have antivirus as a checkbox. You have to have this as a checkbox, right? But if you're, if you're compliant, are you secure? No? But if you're secure, are you probably compliant? Unless you're talking about Germany or, or you know, Great Britain. Yeah, if you're secure, you're probably compliant. So we've got to flip that around, you know, manage Manage compliance through security, not the other way around. Um, European countries accepted. Another thing that we see is that you know people get a lot of different. Um, they get all these different tools. You know they're cutting loose with a whole bunch of money to buy a lot of tools out there. But for one, they're not they're not properly configured. They're not integrated. It's just another thing to look at, right? A, a security tool just becomes one more thing. 
to deal with that doesn't solve a problem in an automated way. And so something that we frequently do in instant response engagements is we'll go out and we'll basically integrate these tools, we'll turn on features, we'll get stuff reacting right away or you know, immediately in an automated fashion so people don't have to actually click a button to make it happen um, uh, and, and, uh, and get things working and then we can basically take back an organization through the existing tool sets that they have. Um, but nobody's in the business of being hacked, right? Is that anybody's business model in here? Who here is in the business of being hacked, right? Um, and there's some, there's some customers that we've, we've seen who maybe they should be classified as that, but, but it, it's not, it's, there's obviously no, nobody's main line of business. However, on my team, it's, that's what we do all day long, right? We do instant response all day long. We see, we see wide swaths you know, across every different you know, type of organization out there. We see what works, what doesn't. And so it helps to, to work with a professional um, who, who does, it, well, it does it all the time and can provide assistance for your particular situation. <clears throat> Another problem, obviously, is, is the uh, perimeter. Where is the perimeter anymore anyway? I mean, anybody have data in the cloud? Right? Probably everybody has data in the cloud in some way, whether it's your Gmail or it's, or it's something, uh, Google Drive. Um, the biggest problems that we're seeing out there, though, we've seen a lot of cloud hacks. And clouds have really good what I call front door security. Ooh, I better, better almost wrap this up. I got five minutes left. Clouds have really good front door security where they're good at keeping people, good people out of other people's stuff. Um, but uh, if you're going to use the cloud, make sure that everything you put in there is encrypted or you don't mind it getting stolen. All right, I got to zoom through some of this stuff here. Um, so incident management frameworks. One thing that we, we will do when we walk into an organization, um, almost no matter what type of, of uh, incident response type activity we're doing, we'll take a look at the organization and what they're doing within the incident management framework. We'll take a look if you have the ability to identify hacks, uh, and, and, and most companies don't. They, they don't have the ability to identify if they've actually been, been, been attacked, uh, and then move on through the rest of the steps within it. You know, communication, collection of information, analysis, containment. Um, all the way down to policies, procedures, playbooks, you know, and, uh, and training. Does your team have the appropriate training? These are definite things that we need to focus on in order to help companies be able to best defend themselves and their networks and protect the security of their customers. Here's an example of some of the tools that we use when we go on site. And I, I'm, I'm vendor neutral. I don't, I don't make any money off of selling products. I just like, I just like products that work. Um, and I have relationships with, with uh, about 140 something different companies that we have partnerships with. And so I can use any tool I want. Um, and so I'll generally work with, with uh, these different companies and use, just sort of pick and choose best of breed products um, from different companies. Kind of a, a common suite of tools I'm using these days. It's either a combination of, of Fire Amp, which I think is the neatest tool in the world. It's the, it's the coolest thing that I, I think I've probably ever used for incident response because it gives me so many answers so quickly. And so I'll, I'll lead with, Basically, uh, after I do some log analysis and figure out what nodes are affected, we'll throw FireAmp in those boxes and find out what's going on. Then we'll jump in and do a deep dive investigation with something like NCASE Enterprise or FDK Enterprise uh, and handle the remediation with that as well. Um, <clears throat> and that's uh, just a kind of an expedited workflow that we've developed because we get so many attacks coming through, we just can't spend a lot of time on it. And we've actually been able to reduce the response time in some cases, where it started out using traditional incident response methodology to about, from about three weeks in time, and I've reduced it to 16 hours on one occasion. Two similar sized companies, both had 5,000 nodes, same malware, um, same security team, just different tool sets, and, and, uh, and maybe one had a little bit faster response time in getting our agents out there. One took about three weeks, um, which, which, you know, because we had a hard time getting our agents out and getting some stuff done, and, and, and then, but that was with traditional forensics approaches, and the other one took 16 hours and just mitigated it. That place was clean. So it was uh, kind of an awesome uh, study. I, I had one of my guys working on a, a white paper or a case study for that. But I think my time is about up. I want to thank, thank, thank you for your time. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here.